Hello, hello, and welcome to another episode of the Blue Oval Podcast. I am Ben Weissel, and joining me, as always, Garrett Zatlin. How's it going, man? Ben, since we have a track and field website, um, and we talk about some of the most fit and most aerobically gifted people in the world, um, I try to stay also like somewhat in shape. I try to go to the gym. I try to eat healthy. I had a cobble today, but it was so damn bad. It was so awful that I've since resorted to uh, iced tea and Pringles because that's the kind of loser I am. And um, I just, I couldn't stomach half a, half a salad. So um, I don't know how that's relevant for today's episode, but I just felt like if there was going to be any random intro, that would be what I had for today. I am not going to describe my diet because it is not good. Uh, I am still living the I run 60 to 70 miles a week diet, even though I have not run in several months due to an injury. So we are praying that my metabolism keeps up until I get healthy again. So we'll, I we'll feel see. like I feel like having a kid, though, is worth like 100 miles a week. I really do. And plus, here's the difference. You can say that you ran 149, 342. I can be like, I biked 30 minutes last week. Like, that's that's the extent of what I'm doing. <sighs> Yeah, well, hey, everybody, everybody's got everybody's got their own thing, right? Uh, some more than others, <laughs> sure, I guess. Uh, let's move on. Reviews. I think we have two new on Spotify. Shout out to Spotify, eighty eight on Spotify, and then uh, none on Apple Podcasts. But we did get a re- what did the review say? I don't have it up in front of me. Yeah, so I love this review because the subject line is alive and listening. So you know they listened to last podcast when I just said I want to know that people are alive and actually listening to I forgot about that. Yeah. So perfect. Um and then the the rest of it said fantastic insight as always and then suggested maybe a reason for the lack of ratings on Apple Podcasts is it's very isn't very intuitive or straightforward to leave slash write a review in the app. Which I agree. Like when I've tried to it's do not. it for other podcasts, I don't ever know if it actually goes through. You know, it's sometimes you have to like have to get cleared, and I I don't know. It's a whole thing. I agree. It's not intuitive at all. It's just we also had like 117 in the last feed, and for whatever reason, like and we had we had to switch feeds. People don't care why, but yeah, it, it's a whole thing. So, um, yeah, I don't know, but it is what it is. Let's talk about though some performances from this past weekend. Interesting weekend, which means that we're gonna have to take an interesting approach on this. Ben and I have each put together a list. We have 11 performances that we agreed needed to be highlighted in some capacity. And then we're now going to take those 11 performances and then rank them from 11 down to one, one being the best, 11 being maybe the least best of the group, if you will. Uh, And then trying to figure out which one was the the best slash most important slash most valuable performance, however you want to interpret it. Um, But that's what we're going to do today. So Ben, do you want to start? Sure. Do we want to start at the bottom or the top? Start at 11 and go to our top. Okay. So I will start. And the performance that I had was Ethan Strand's 359. Mm. North Carolina's okay. own, breaking four, 17th on the performance list right now. Solid performance, but at the end of the day, still going to be several seconds off a of national qualifying result. Yeah, so when we started doing this, I said that you and I were going to have some disagreements. That is um, going to be one of the disagreements. Off to a not good in start. a dramatic, yeah, not in one, not in a dramatic way, but um, I had Parks, Taryn Parks of UNC, running four thirty eight to win the mile the Hokie invite. Uh, let's talk about the, those two performances, though. Uh, I think with Strand, you know, for him running three fifty nine, he's still super young, and. I think that UNC group, like we're still kind of like waiting to see which of those like really young guys other than Parker Wolf, we're going to really step up and start contributing at like a nationally competitive level. And it's not that I don't think we didn't think they could do it, but now Strand finally has a 359 mark. I think this means a lot for UNC's DMR, um, especially with Jesse Hunt running so incredibly well. Parker Wolf could certainly play a role on that as well. Um, and now you add a 359 guy to the mix. Things now get a little bit more interesting, especially when they even have Kyle Reinheimer at 148 as well. So I think Strand, just in terms of long-term value, knowing that he's up there, knowing that he can be competitive, knowing that he's still improving, still young, and that he's timing you know this, this rise at a perfect time, 
I think that makes him a little more valuable. Parks, it's not that her 438 result was bad. It's just kind of what we expected. Like, I, I said, like, hey, one of these three UNC women are going to win. They're going to run 437, 438, and they did. So. Yeah, I'm not going to argue with you too much. I had Parks as a, as 10th. I mean, Strand had run 401 before, so it, it, it isn't like running 359 it, it is wild um, for him to expect out of him. Um, but like you said, yeah, it, it is good for North Carolina from a DMR perspective. Gives them another option. Um, and then Parks, I, I, I think you could flip a coin on whether a 438 or a 359 is considered quote-unquote better. Um, and I think we just flip different coins. My coin's just better, um, but but no, and and I and to be very clear, when we're ranking, because everyone's going to listen to this and be like, they said it was the worst performance of the weekend. That's not what we're saying. We're saying you have to have 11, a good performance to get into. You the, have to have this a discussion. very good, exactly. You have to have a very good performance. Four thirty eight mile and three fifty nine mile, both for wins, by the way, are really impressive. Um, I just think Strand's result has a little more overall value that maybe we're not giving him credit for. So I'll give him the nod there. Not going to argue with you too much there. All right. Who did you have at nine? Who did I have at nine? Let me look at this up. I have this on my phone because my laptop's freaking out right now. Um, I had Tulsa's 750 marks from Michael Power and from Isaac Aker. Scott, Scott Beatty? Isaac Scott Beatty. Scott Beatty, thank you. Scott Beatty and Michael Power, pair of 750 marks. Tulsa as a whole actually put four guys under eight minutes. Um, really strong, but Tulsa also did that last year. I, I'll say this, it's harder to put four guys under eight minutes in the same race. Mm-hmm. That's different. Um, but like Beatty's run faster before. Power's a 5K All-American. This doesn't, they're not going to be like, they're not going to be into the national meet with those times. Probably not. I, I just, I just, it's not that it wasn't impressive. It was a great overall performance. I thought it was awesome, but I just don't know if we learned anything new. I mean, it was a crazy display of depth. Like when you have <laughs> nine, like they, they had, I think not 10 guys finished this race and nine of them ran eight Oh seven or faster, which is just a, a very strong performance, basically like a practice meet for them. Um, and, and to see BDA and power run 750 isn't surprising. Like you said, we would expect both of those guys to run faster as the year goes along. Um, but I mean, it's a good mark and, and there just aren't a whole lot of people running that fast this early in the year in the three K like we've only seen four other performances faster and two of them were in December right off of cross country season. So um it it is rare to see that quick of times run this early and i think bodes well for them uh, as they go to more competitive races uh when they're fitter and later on and so did you have tulsa in the upper half of this list at all or is it should i wait i have them ninth as well okay Okay. Uh, i had them them, what 10 i had them 10 oh you had them 10th okay so you had ethan strand further up I, I do have Ethan Strand further up, yes. Oh, wow. All righty. And I think this is where some people are going to disagree with me. Um, so that was your nine, correct? Yes. Yep. So your your 10 was Taron Parks, mm-hmm. your 11 was uh, Ethan Strand, and your nine was Tulsa, correct? Yes. People are maybe going to get on me about this one. My nine... Is Shane Bracken running 357 and Anthony Camieri running 358? Here's the thing. Ben and I, when when we first got on here, Ben goes, How surprised were you that you know Bracken you know ran 357 and Camieri didn't beat him or whatever? And I go, I'm not surprised at all, <laughs> like in the slightest. Bracken has actually run 357 before. He's actually run just mm-hmm. the tiniest bit faster. Camieri was already a four flat miler, but just was awesome during the fall months. It is super unsurprising to me that he's run through 58. This is a middle distance program. Those guys have run up to this level before. I don't think it really changes the dynamic of what they can do nationally. I, I, I just don't know what I was supposed to be surprised about. Again, it's a good performance. I know people are going to like you know be like, you don't think it's a good pro-? Of course I do think it's a good performance. I just don't know if I learned anything new or if it changed the NCAA landscape. Um, could they run faster? Of course. And then this is a different conversation. 
I, I just wasn't surprised. I just said, like, yeah, this is about right. So I have them further up, uh, but I, I'm just as maybe underwhelmed in terms of like, I'm not surprised by this performance, but I still think they're very good runs. Um, I, I think for, I, I was curious to see what Camieri would do coming off of his breakout cross country season um, with it, it being his first year at Ole Miss. I, I was thinking he could take a, a sizable step forward in terms of his mile PR. He, I mean, he's run, he ran 341 in the 1500 last spring. So, I mean, that that's about that 358 mark that he ran this weekend. So I, I was just uh, thinking that he would be a second or two faster. Um, and then Bracken, I mean, like you said, this is pretty much exactly what I, I would have envisioned him doing, 357. So it me thinking that Camieri would beat him isn't so much a slight at Bracken. I, I think he's obviously going to be right in the qualifying picture. And if he's not, he's going to be great. Uh, one of the best DMR pieces for uh, Ole Miss. But I, I, I just thought Camieri would take a bigger step forward like he did in cross country. And, and he might later on in the season. Um, but I, I just, I think I have really high expectations for him going into the track season. Yeah. And I think that's totally fair. I think he's going to be awesome in the 3k. Yeah. I mean, I think he's going to run something just stupid fast. I think he'll run like 745 or 746. I really do. I think he's going to run probably something along those lines. Um, yeah, it's not that I don't think these weren't good performances. I just don't know if these performances told us anything new. I don't know if I was really surprised and I don't really think it changes the NCAA landscape of what a team could do. I think we kind of knew old miss could be competitive in the DMR. This doesn't change that. So it's again, not that it's a bad performance. Just, just didn't think it was one of the most impactful ones is all. I think that's totally fair. I, I think we had slightly different criteria when, yeah, when, yeah. when we were ranking, sure we which, which makes it more fun. Um, all right. So number, so we've gotten your nine, 10, 11. I had Bracken and Camieri further up. You have Ethan Strand further up at eight. I had Anika Rice um, at four, her 436 converted uh, mile at altitude in my eight spot. I had that a little bit higher. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I can understand why you put her at eight. Um, I had Kip Yego, 147. Um, at his home track. Um, what do you want to talk about first? Do we want to talk about Rice or Kipiego? Let's go with Rice because I, I have Kipiego a few spots higher as well. So with Rice, I mean, this was a, I, I believe, a PR, converted PR. Yeah, um, converted PR. Yes. So, I, I mean, very good run for her coming off a great cross-country season where she just missed being an All-American. Um She's run well in the 1500 this past spring, running 423. Um, but this is clearly a big step uh, up for her. She came back and also ran 211 in the 800 unconverted, which I would imagine is sub 210 um, after you take in the conversion. So, I mean, just an excellent weekend for her all around. This is her first uh, race on the indoor oval after cross country. I, I mean, there really isn't anything bad I can say about it. I think she's right, going to be right on that edge for qualifying with this time. So you would imagine she's going to run something faster and make it to the national meet. I, I just, I, I don't know how much this is changing necessarily the NCAA picture, other than she looks like she's going to be one of those 16 in Albuquerque in the mile. Yes. Yeah. I disagree. I think it just tells us a lot, actually. I think Rice was obviously. Um, and by the way, we apologize if we're butchering that name. I assume it's Rice, but um, but she was so good in the grass, right? Had mm -hmm. you know some performances were better than others, but I think it's very easy to get distracted by how good her teammate Elise Stearns was in terms of the breakout fall that she had. She wasn't an All American, but she was awfully close. I think she was in the top fifty at the national meet, forty seventh, forty um, seventh. Yeah, and so you kind of look at what she did there, it's easy to kind of forget how talented she was and how much she's improved. But I don't think we also had any true idea. Like I was not at all under the impression that she was definitely going to run faster than 440 this season converted. Right. Um, I didn't know, like she was a solid 3k runner, a solid 5k runner. Like she's been a solid miler, but she's never really been 
like at this nationally competitive level before. And now it's in her first race of the year, responds very well to altitude, runs converted 436 in January. She's now in the conversation to make the national meet. And now we question, okay, then what can she do in the 3K? What can she do in the 5K? Are those distances more conducive to success for her now that she's actually proven that she can translate the cross-country fitness to the track? I think there's a lot of key developments here. I think that this latest result was really important just in terms of what she can do, how she can crack the national meet, and where else she can thrive. So I, I thought that's why I put her a little bit higher in my most important slash impressive slash best list, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think those are all the fair, fair things to say about the performance. And I, it'll be interesting to see what ends up being her best event. Like you mentioned, like it would, what do we see from her in the three K does she run a five K uh, and does she end up going in one of those other events besides the mile um, come national qualifying season? So you had Kip Yego uh, and then Peter Smith, his teammate, running 147, 148 as your next performance. Talk to me about why you had that in your eighth spot. Yeah, you know, and it's such, I feel like a little bit of a hypocrite when I do this because I had all, I had been asking him, like, hey, Kip Yego, great first year, great first year. Um, great first year as a rookie. Now, can you take that next step, right? Can you now be a national contender? Can we potentially make it out of the prelims of the national meet. He had never been to a national meet before. S- still hasn't, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I kind of want to see, like, can you take that next step? On the indoor oval, he seemingly has. He's run, I think, 0.44 off of his PR, 147.66. Um, but it was a time, I think, that we kind of knew he was capable of running. I mean, he obviously ran a little bit faster during the spring months. Um, I think if you had told me coming into the season, hey, Kip, is going to be right on the fringe of potentially qualifying, I would have said, yeah, that makes total sense. Um, I don't know. I think he he beat who he was supposed to. So I I feel like a little bit of a hypocrite saying, can you get to that next level? He does it. And then being like, oh, well, it's not even in the top half of the most impressive performances from this past weekend. But I I still think it was a great result. I just just don't know, like I said, if it changes anything about how I originally thought about him. So I had them just in my top half of the rankings, and, and I think it goes a lot because of Peter Smith as well as Kip Yego. Mm-hmm. I thought this was a really good run, a uh, really good weekend for uh, Smith, who ended up running 148 in the 800, but then also ran four flat in the mile, um, showing a much better strength. He's run 148.0 before outdoors but i think this is his fastest time that he's run indoors he had run 148.3 uh in december and, and looks like he's just continued to carry that fitness ran 222 in the uh, thousand last weekend i i think he's trending in the right direction and, and as someone that is almost certainly going to be part of their dmr i would guess in some capacity and, and i think it he is going to be on the fringe of qualifying in the 800. Um, But if he doesn't, he's going to be a, just a massive piece in that DMR and make them potentially one of the more uh, potent DMRs if they run the right people. So I agree. Um, I think if you're including Smith into that mix, and I think I kind of told you to do that and then I didn't. So, you know, (laughs) it goes to show what I, what I know. But I think that's fair. I think if you were include what Smith did this weekend, and I'm not even going to lie, I take a lot of pride in reading the results, understanding what they mean, kind of, I take a lot of pride in that. It's my job. It's my career. Um, I missed Smith running for flat. And you you said that, and I was like, I have to pull up T-first. Um, and it's, it's really impressive. A 148 four flat double is so good. That is so it's good. It's so what, hard to do that. Like, you have to be that's so three hours. strong. Yeah, I, I and that's what I like. So from someone who was certainly not a strength based middle distance runner, this was like doing these kind of doubles was very challenging, but you have to be, I mean, and he's always been more predominantly an 800 guy to be able to have the strength to come back and run that fast in your off event. It is really impressive. Well, I think they they went mile then eight. Oh, okay, did they? Yeah, I think they went mile eight. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, yeah, that's. I mean, I think that one forty eight looks even better then. I mean, yeah. that's that's. I mean, he's going to run under one forty eight this year then. 
Yeah, man, they they build him tough at Army. Like you know, he's a transfer from Army. <laughs> uh, that's why I say that. I mean, that's it's so it's super impressive. And when you add that to what Kid Diego did, then I would agree this is going higher. I didn't have that factored in, even though I told you to. But I I I should have had that higher. So I I agree with everything that you said there. Smith Smith might be one of the like individually one of the three or four best performances individually this week. Yeah, yeah, he was really good. I, I, well, before we we started talking, I was like, could he be there, Iowa State's next uh, Jason Gomez? I don't, I don't know if he has that same high end ceiling, but I, I mean, he's certainly turned into another success story for for Iowa State's middle distance program. I mean, how much how much eligibility does he have here? He's a junior right now. He he has flashes. He reminds me of uh, like Festus Legat Light. Yeah, I think that double is very Festus Legat Light. I don't know if he can do the cross country aspect of it, but no, still, no, still. no one can do that. <laughs> that yeah, Fet Legat was so good at that. Okay, let's move on. That was eight. Who did you have at seven? I had Wilma Nielsen at two or three, or in her two or three in the eight hundred at seven. Okay, I had her six. I had Strand at seven. Let's okay. talk about Nielsen here. Uh, I had her one spot ahead. Why? Well, let's just let's just talk about Nielsen here. Uh, I, I think this was a good performance, and uh, this is isn't a uh, a PR for her, right? She's run two hundred two before, is that correct? Correct. So, Shout out to um, the for yeah. So, but still, right off a of PR, um, running it indoors, she she ran a, a decent six hundred last weekend, running one twenty nine. She's coming off of, um, I, I think that last summer when she ran that two hundred two, is that correct? So, a good summer. Uh, I think, um, yeah, two, like she went two summers in a row, apparently from what I saw. Okay. So coming off some, some good training over the last year. Uh, and, and I think it's just has put herself in the national picture where she could absolutely qualify in the 800. I, I don't know in this loaded field, if that means she's going to make it to the finals, but she's certainly a name to keep an eye on. Uh, and I am curious to see what we see from her the rest of the year she finished third in this race behind um what was that two pros it looks like so uh really and olivia baker 202 i mean it is no joke so i i really good performance and i'm curious to see if she can build on that uh throughout the season i like this result a lot um i think the the challenge was is that she had run two hundred two right she had run two hundred two apparently multiple times um, I didn't see that but I I believe it um, the the thing is like she had never she had run three eight hundred meter races on the indoor oval per Tifers at the collegiate level um, and they had never been faster than two hundred nine she had been running a slew of two hundred five two hundred six two hundred seven marks throughout her career uh, on the outdoor oval with Bradley. And it was just like, she's always been good and even competitive, right? I think she even made a national meet at at one point, but she's never really gotten to that next step. I think it's fair to maybe argue that trying to qualify for the indoor national meet is a little harder. You Mm -hmm. you, you, you still rely on tactics on the outdoor oval. It doesn't mean it's not still impressive, Um, but it's harder, I I think, to, to qualify for the national meet on the indoor oval. And so for her to take that next step to run 203, to actually get to this point, opens up the rest of her season in terms of what she can do. She doesn't have to like, you know, panic race. We've all had seasons like that where we're trying to hit a certain mark and we're panic racing throughout the last three or four weeks of the season, trying to get a certain mark, whether for personal or for championship settings. Um, Yeah. I I think it's really important from that perspective. And because it shows that she can return to her top form. And if that is an indication that she's returning to top form, then she can be very dangerous moving forward. Yeah, it's just so big to get that big result out of the way and and to not have to worry about it. Because, yeah, I agree. I think qualifying for indoors is uh, much more impressive because you have to be on your game at some point several weeks before nationals. You have to be hitting almost peak conditions to be able to run as fast as you need to, especially now, uh, to qualify. So, yeah, I I think that's a really awesome performance from her. but in a loaded 800 field, it, it's going to be hard for her to make a little noise, which is why I had her at seventh and not a little bit higher. Yeah, I think it will depend on the rest of her season. Like, mm-hmm. this is now, okay, show me what you can do next. What can you do in the mile? Can you replicate this time? How does this translate to tactics? 
uh, I'm, I'm not ready to make any major declarations about her, either good or bad. I think we just need to see a couple more weeks and see see what happens. Absolutely. So that was my seven. And who did you, you had Strand at seven, you said? I had, I had Strand at seven, Nielsen at six. Who was your six? I had Bracken and Camieri. You had Bracken and Camieri. Wow. Okay. I guess that's not a dramatic jump, no. but it's okay. I'm still there. All right. Do we, do we need to talk about them any further or should we move on? No, I, I think we're good there. Okay. Who is your, uh, who's your five? Five is where I had Kip Yeager and Smith. Okay. And five is where I had Anika Rice. Um, okay. Where'd you have, where'd you have so, Rice? Seven? I had her eighth. So yeah. And I, I don't know. I, I might consider moving her up a little bit, but I, again, I, I really like the Bracken Camieri and the Capiego yeah. and Smith. So, yeah, the, the again Capiego Smith, I would probably move up when you can factor in Smith and, all, and even Baston. Isaac Baston ran a great race. It was one forty eight yeah. for him in that race. So, um, okay, let's go. So, r- remind me, your five was Bracken and Camieri. So they were six. Capiego and Smith was fifth. So I think we have the same yeah, top four. It may be in some different order, though. In um, probably a different order, I would guess. Who was your four? Duncan Hamilton, 743, flat track, adjusted. Mm, that's not what I had. Let's talk about that before I give my, Let's talk about that before I give my four. Okay, so this one I was going back and forth on. I, I think I had him all the way up to two at one point, and then dropped him back to four. So I could easily be convinced to, to move him. Uh, further up so 743 flat track plus altitude conversion eight flat unconverted i mean it we we talk about these conversions but he's someone that should just be immune from this we've seen him run so fast before he's run 18 seconds slower in the 3k steeple like uh just based off of unconverted times like he's obviously this good He's going to run seven, probably 743 or faster at, at um, not at altitude. He's going to be great. He's going to be one of the best competitors in the 3K, I think, this year. It'll be curious to see if he tries to run a 5K um, and mix, try to double at Nationals. Um, I mean, he already ran 1334, I guess, now that I'm looking at his t first. So he's going to have to run faster than that to qualify. But yeah, I, I think it was a great performance, but I didn't learn a whole lot. I don't know if this necessarily m- makes me want to move him up in my 3K rankings, maybe a little bit, but not substantially. You're, you've convinced me. You've convinced me. I had I had him obviously a little bit higher. Um, and I think honestly, though, you, I think there's arguments to be made for any of these next four performances to be in mm-hmm. any kind of order. Um yeah, I I don't know. I think just seven. Like, it's still so impressive. It is. You get a seven forty, like running eight flat at that altitude on a flat track. It's worth every second of that seventeen Absolutely. second, roughly seventeen second conversion. It's so impressive. I just don't know if I would have said Duncan Hamilton would have had a seven forty three mark and point zero one seconds off of the NCAA leader as we enter the last week of January. Um, I think it just puts him at another level that maybe past conversions never did, his past times never did. At the same time, I don't. You're kind of right. I don't really know how shocked we should be, but the the, the performance itself is so impressive that I'm kind of leaving behind my, well, how surprising slash valuable slash important this result is, and I'm now forcing myself to be like, well, this is just so darn impressive. So I'm changing my rules on the spot here. <laughs> um, but it's it's so impressive. I think Duncan Hamilton. We've talked about this before we came on. He is now he should now be immune to the well mm-hmm. are those conversions really real kind of conversation. It just like in you know just like the Colorado Mines men at the D two level, everyone loves to give them crap about like well are you really all that good? Yeah, they they dominated every national meet at the cross country level for the past what two three years. So I think Duncan Hamilton has now run fast enough multiple times, steeplechase success, all that to say like, yeah, I think this is probably realistic. So I, I mean, in retrospect, I'd probably bring him back a little bit just because it's not as surprising, but the performance itself 
was so impressive. It's stellar. Uh, and, and I mean, to do it this early in the season, like you mentioned, it, it is very impressive. Um, I mean, we obviously talked about Kieran Lum's performance in, in weeks past and, and how good that was um, for like without any competition and how early it was in the season. So yeah, absolutely a great performance. I think Duncan Hamilton's just been so good that it, it's, it's, he has to do something otherworldly to make me, uh, super surprised. Um, so who did you have at the fourth spot? I regret this now that I, now that I have it here. Um, it was, uh, Franklin and Corcoran. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, we're going to have some I, big I, disagreements there. I know I can, I can already, I already knew what this was going to happen. And I, and I just, I just, yeah. And I, I, in retrospect, I should have put them a little higher again. It's they're the top four. I mean, I don't know. The, the nice thing about this is I think everyone can clearly see that like there's a clear cutoff after the top four. Yes. Like, there's yeah. a top four and then there's everyone else. So I feel comfortable putting them in the, the best of the best of this tier. Yeah. I, and listen, it's, it's another one of those things where it's so impressive. It does change my opinion of Baylor Franklin quite a bit. Um, the reason I put it back is because I think I initially was like, I, initially I didn't know that he, or I forgot that he ran 145 at USA's his last summer. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, was so um, good, like at USA's. So he was, he was, I, I just forgot. I just flat out forgot. Right. That's what happens when you strictly rely on TFers and don't look at world athletics, so on and so forth. But he was awesome. Right. 145. And so that's why I look at this 146 on a 300 meter track and think like, okay, that's not totally unrealistic in that case. Right. And that's why I maybe put him four instead of two or three. Uh, but you add in Corcoran there running 147 after not racing last spring you know, he's a returning all American. It was just a phenomenal, you know, both pair of times. And honestly, when you consider the fact that Franklin had never run under 148 on the indoor oval before per Tifers, that's so impressive to now make that jump then to a 146. He looks like he's probably going to be one of the better names of the NCAA for the middle distances this year. He's, I, I think he maybe has a legitimate shot of being like a, like an upset contender for the SEC title, maybe. I think it changes a lot. And now in retrospect, I'm wishing I put both him and Corcoran higher. I had them four. Um, like I said, I probably regret that, but I have them higher. And I think it's, yeah, I think it's true. because with Franklin, this performance legitimately makes me put him in, in the contender status. Like I, I, I don't, I don't think he's the favorite, but another performance like this against maybe some better competition. And, and he's there like for him to do this in January run 146 in January it is just really impressive. We obviously, like you said, remember what he did at USA is when he looked like he was, he had gone to another level um, just from like, even when he ran at NCAAs, when he didn't even make it to finals at NCAAs and, and outdoors, but then he just something clicked um, when he got to USA's and it seems like that has carried over um, to this indoor season. And, and I, I legitimately think of him as in the inner circle of 800 contenders now. And, and I don't think any other performance really this weekend was as impactful in my mind because of that. All right. Wow. That was just a complete decimation of my opinion, <laughs> but that's okay. And, but, but rightfully so, like, you know, I, I try to own up to it. I, I think like my ranking so far, I have pretty good, like, logic and reason behind it i don't have a good reason why i put them four i probably should have put them both higher that's my apology i probably would have put them i would have swapped them with duncan hamilton um okay let's go to three who'd you have at three lindsey butler 242 which is the exact same case as duncan hamilton like i i think those are nearly identical results in a lot of ways just a hugely impressive run to run 242 in the thousand but it's lindsey butler like she was our TSR uh, number two, I believe. Um, three, number three. Like she, she was that for a reason, and because we know how good she can be. She's the eight hundred favorite, and this performance did nothing to change that. I don't think it made us view her any better, um, but it's still a really good performance and shows that she's fit and ready to go for this indoor season. I disagree slightly. Um, I have two things here. Um, one, I do think we learned something here. Uh, she was injured in the spring, raced well in cross country, ran a nice 3K PR to start the year, start the season. 
I don't, you know, it's just she hadn't raced since March of last year on the track, I should say, on the track. And I think there's fair questions to be had about, like, hey, what's, like, her current speed like? What's her turnover like? How effective can she be? Like, I don't think I would have said that she was going to run a PR, um, or at least under 243 for that matter. So I, I don't know. I, I think that, I think this is just confirmation that she is still near the best of her fitness. Yeah. Her speed is still maybe at the best it's ever been. And I don't think that's always guaranteed when people are coming back from injuries, right? Like it's really hard to time your fitness to be so perfect. And Coach Eric J, I'm not even going to try to say his last name, but Coach Eric J at Virginia Tech, like he, he quietly is putting together a really nice group of men, really nice group of women. There had two other women run under 245 for 1,000 meters. I think it was Ava Hassebrock and Hannah Ballow. Great marks all around. I just I just thought it was an overall great performance from Butler and from Virginia Tech. I have a question for you here. Mm-hmm. If you're starting an indoor track team <laughs> from 800 up to 5K includes DMR, yeah, who would you rather start your team with? Lindsey Butler or Parker Volby? Hmm. That's an excellent question. So... Thank you. Butler, where she is a legit national contender in the 800 in the mile. Not any really further than that. And then Volby is the inverse, where 3K, 5K, absolute national contender. Probably, I mean, maybe is a little bit better in the mile than Butler would be in the 3K. But oh, it... Yeah. Um, are are we saying eligibility, or are we just saying like you just get them for this year? Uh, Am I making this too this. complicated? Them, yeah. No, I don't think it's a fair question. I think you get them for this year for sure. With because Caitlin Tui exists, I think I'll go with Lindsay Butler. Yeah, that's kind of where my head's at too. I, I think Volby in a vacuum is better. But we don't live in a vacuum. There's other people that are in this in this competition, namely Caitlin Tui, and I think that makes Butler the choice. Yeah, we live in a simulation, not a vacuum. Um, yeah. But no, it's. <laughs> I, I I think I would have gone with Butler. I, I I don't know if like we can definitively say like oh Volby's more talented than Butler, but I just, there's just no way to compare it. I just don't. The reason why I go with Butler is because a I think her path to a national title is clearer. Yes. And B, I think, I think she brings this much more value in the DMR relative to what Volvi would. Yes, and so I think I that agree. gives her three events relative to Volvi's two and a half, right? So that yep. that's the only reason why I just wanted to ask that. But yeah, I think we're all on the same page. Shout out to uh, to Butler; she ran very well. All right, so we both had Butler at three. We did, and then so I had did... Hamilton two at two. All right, so my two, which I am discovering is your one, is Jenna Swing Hammers, 242 in the 1,000, and like the rest of her Kentucky teammates running 243, 244, 244, Sydney Seeley, Phoebe McCowan, and Deanna Martin. Like just an incredible performance by Kentucky and their middle distance crew. Um, I, I mean, and for Swing Hammer, this just, vaults her to another level she was obviously very good um this past fall um she 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 had improved um but this on the track is just a huge step up she had run 203 last spring and had nearly made it to nationals but this shows that she is ready to compete firmly at the national level I am so excited because it's just, it's just nice to have some new blood, Ben. Like, yep. It's just, it's nice to have Kentucky in this. It's, it's nice. another, more people for the 800 though. Like how many people <laughs> yeah. can we have in this 800 field? Well, who's to say it's the 800? Yeah, it could be the mile. The mile. Could, yeah. I mean, sounds like a lot of people should anyways. It's, uh, I, here's the thing. Kentucky showed a lot of promise last year. Fifth place DMR, all mm-hmm. Americans. Like they had Tori Herman and now Perry Bockworth has been great since the last spring. Um, you know, Schwinghammer's been good. They had all these different you know, women. They brought in Sydney Steely. 
Deanna Martin obviously just had a great race. You just start going down the list. It's so like Phoebe McCown's been great since last winter. Like there are now multiple women who I'm like, oh, this is like a competitive group. They've shown signs of it last year, and now they've brought it to a new level. I really liked Sh- uh, Schwinghammer a lot. I don't think I ever expected her to get to this point, much less in a year. Um, I I really like her, maybe just because she has a really cool name, but I didn't realize that she would be this good. And then to have three teammates run 244 or faster, if Lindsay Butler ran 244, we'd shrug our shoulders and go, yeah, that's about right for someone of her caliber. Maybe we thought, okay, maybe she can run 243, 242. But I don't think anyone would be freaking out about that if Lindsay Butler ran it. Three Kentucky girls just ran that, and Laurel Wynn of Ole Miss ran 243. But I, I I think that's the best performance. It's not just because Schwinghammer elevated to a new level. It's because now Kentucky has one of the deepest middle distance group. If I had told you coming into this weekend that Kentucky would have the clear cut best middle distance group <laughs> over Virginia Tech, I mean, you wouldn't have believed me. No, no, I, I it, it is a stunning display of talent and depth. Um, and, and, we're talking about these thousand times, and I think it's hard for maybe some people to contextualize these. It, like this, a thousand isn't the, uh, a event that's competed at nationals. People don't necessarily know what times relate to. That's four twenty mile pace, like for a thousand, which is just staggering. And I mean, it's, tells to you clarify, to clarify real quick that. That doesn't mean it converts to 420. No, it's no, but that pace. is 420 yeah. pace. So I'm not sure what that converts to, but her running low 430s is certainly in the picture now. Um, and for her to run just as fast um, as Butler did is another clear indicator of where she's at. So I, I, I think, like you said, I struggled with whether to put this performance one versus two. I think this puts her at the national level. The reason why I don't have them at one is I don't think this puts her at the contender level. Um, and when we're talking about most impor- important performances, I, I think a performance that elevates you to that contender circle is ultimately the most important. But the overall depth here nearly put made me push them to number one. For perspective... Um, Butler's 242 mark, which was run on a 200 meter track, which I do think gives gives her a little bit of an edge over Schwinghammer. Schwinghammer sure. ran hers on a 300 meter track, and but I that, can tell you that was... track is fast. It's so fun yeah. to run out at Vanderbilt. Yeah, well, Virginia Tech is quick too, but Vanderbilt's quick. Um, what was I even going to say? Schwinghammer, yeah, uh, so Butler is now listed at NCAA number 12 all time on the official eligible NCAA women's 1000 meter list. Schwinghammer, if you included the all-performance best, basically saying any off-distance of 300-meter tracks, things of that nature, she's NCAA number 14, unless there were other 1,000-meter performances that we completely missed. I don't think we did. Um, So that that puts into perspective. She's one of the 15 fastest women, regardless of track size, in collegiate history, to run a 1,000-meter race. That's wild. And she and I, I'm correct in saying that 800 she ran was after this as well. I I couldn't tell you convincingly. I would think so, but I don't know that for a fact. She ran 205.97 in the 800 to win that as well. So I whether think she, she I think that was day two. Okay, yeah, you, you might be right. Um, so also a good good indicator of where she's at and her teammates behind her like the, those four women who ran fast in the thousand went 206 208 208 as well so i mean they they also backed it up and ran like not spectacularly fast in the 800 but also very well um the women's 1000 meters was run um at 8 p.m on friday and then the women's 800 meters was run at 3.25 p.m. on Saturday. So that's a two-day okay. double. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it, it's just – it was so good. It was so, so good. Like, I mean, I think we knew Sydney Steely was good. I think people who really observed Phoebe, uh, Phoebe McCown would have known that she's actually really underrated and really good um, for Deanna Martin to run as fast as she did at 2.44. I know she's run 2.05 before, but like – 
shout out to uh, uh, what I think it's Ho- uh, Coach Hakron Devise. I know I'm butchering that name. I apologize. But at, at Kentucky, I mean, he did a phenomenal job. Said, hey, we're going to show potential in 2022, and now we're going to be a problem in 2023. Just super, super impressive. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Great performance. So they were number two for me, um, number one for you. Um, my number one was Franklin and Corcoran, um 800 performances. We didn't really talk about Corcoran at all um, before. He, he ran 148 uh, or 147, excuse me, led most of that race, um, really pushed it. And, and I think this is another good stepping stone for him. This is a PR um, he, he was at the NCAA championships last indoor season, didn't run outdoors. He was fifth, um, last year in the 800, which I, I think a lot of people, including me forget about. Um, so he is back and looks like he's going to do problem once again in the 800. He's tactically really sound. Um, he, he's just solid. Like he's, he's never going to like blow you away, but He's, he won the Music City Challenge 800 meters last year in 147, right? He, I think he kind of knew that he could be a little more aggressive in this Vanderbilt race this past weekend mm-hmm. because his teammate Baylor Franklin was there. But, you know, fifth in the prelims at Indoor National Meet last year, fifth then in the finals. He was fourth uh, last winter in the SECs. He's just solid. Like, he, he never really has a bad race, and that's really hard to do. Um, so I, I just got to give him a lot of credit there. I, I think you're right. He's really underrated, really quietly tactically sound. And I think that's going to make all the difference, uh, on the postseason. So absolutely. So yeah, a lot of good performances, is the performances this weekend. Um, and certainly some, like we, we mentioned that are changing our view of how the national, uh, championships are going to look. So, and, and that's only going to be the first taste of it. I, every weekend after this, we're going to see more and more performances that are going to um, blow our minds, change our perspective. And obviously we're looking forward to that. Let us know if, if you had a certain uh, list, your certain lists a little bit different, but I, I think like Garrett said, that top four, you could have put them in almost any order. They were that good this weekend. Yeah. I apologize to the old Miss guys, Baylor Franklin, Tiernan Corton. You guys should have been higher than mine. I apologize. So just, just be, be gentle. I, I know I kind of screwed that one up. That's okay. Um, all right. Do we have anything else? By the way, we're on YouTube. We got our last video up. It took forever. Canva wanted to be very difficult with me. Um, ben knows as I sent him a few, a few edits. Um, but yeah, go check it out. We're on YouTube. Go subscribe. We'll put those out probably every Wednesday, Thursday, I think. Um, and yeah, you can go subscribe and watch us there. That's you it. see our shining faces. Even if some more than to. others. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's dark. It's dark out. It's seven thirty. it's seven twenty twenty seven 27 on Monday. So, uh, all right. Well, I think that's it. Anything you want to plug before we wrap up? Uh, D two, D three rankings coming this week, updated D one rankings coming next week. Um, working on a few things might do a transfer article. That'll be big. If you're a D two guy as well, uh, D two guy or gal. And then we've also got some meet previews coming up as well. I'm actually working on maybe sort of kind of a Q and a for a top recruit, uh, that recently committed. And, uh, also go check out the Penn state article. I did. I kind of, that was a lot of fun on Caleb Nastari going to Penn state. Um, but yeah, that's it. Oh, Ben, before I go, who, what are you happier about? Uh, the Eagles winning or the Cowboys losing? Oh, the the Eagles winning. I I wanted to play the Cowboys. I'd rather play the Cowboys than and then the 49ers. I I wanted to beat them to go to the Super Bowl. I don't want to give Dallas fans any more hope than I have to. <laughs> I I I was I there was no bad result in that Cowboys game for me. I was like either we got to play them next week or they get crushed. It it was good either way. Yeah, I'm a Steelers fan, but I'll root for the Eagles when the Steelers aren't playing. Um so fly birds fly. All right. That's all I got. All right. Well, until next week when I will be either crushed or elated (laughs) about the football results, I'll talk to you. I'll talk to you.